Good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, we are here for an exciting session on hyponatremia. Uh, I hope everyone can listen to me. Today, uh, we'll be listening to Dr. Ajay Hare, who's a senior consultant, Fortis Escort Kidney Institute, Delhi. He's uh, had a celebrated academic record after doing his medical school from Ames, New Delhi. He did his residency at Indiana University, US, followed by a fellowship in Harvard, Boston. And then he served as a faculty in Department of Medicine in Massachusetts before coming back to Delhi to join us all. Uh, AJ, the show is for you now to take it on. Thank you, Dr. Modi, for the introduction. Um, so I'll start uh, with my talk on hyponatremia. And uh, my outline for the talk is going to be I'll focus on causes, diagnosis, uh, and the diagnostic algorithm that I usually follow. Uh, symptoms and impacts of hyponatremia, and then treatment. Hyponatremia uh, causes diagnosis and treatment are actually the three out of the top 10 most reviewed topics in up to date uh, forever and ever. So I will try to focus uh, this talk through cases and try and talk about a few concepts um, with regard to hyponatremia. Uh, I'll go over three slides from my previous talk, which is uh, the basics of water and sodium physiology. And the first concept is that the total content or amount of sodium in the body is uh, the thing that will dictate the extracellular fluid volume. And the sodium concentration is, uh, which is reflected as osmolarity, will reflect the water status of the body and the, that the body regulates osmolarity and volume separately. So if you look at osmolarity, the body senses osmolarity by the hypothalamus osmoreceptors, and then it sends out ADH or thirst or regulates ADH and thirst up and down. And that will affect the water excretion and water intake uh, of the person. And the disorders that are related to osmolarity are hyponatremia and hypernatremia. So actually, hypo and hypernatremia are water problems because the body regulates and controls it through water. In contrast, when you look at volume, uh, volume regulation, which is the total sodium in the body uh, that is being um, looked at, is sensed as effective circulating volume and is sensed as the carotid sinus, the afferent arteriole, the atria, and the um, effectors are renin angio aldosystem, the natriuretic peptide ADH, and the sympathetics. The thing that is affected is urinary sodium excretion, and the disorders of uh, volume regulation are uh, volume depletion or edema and volume overload. And these are actually sodium problems rather than being uh, um, uh, the volume uh, is. Too sodium in the body and the only overlap between the two is ADH which is what is highlighted in red and if you look at how ADH is regulated so these white uh, circles are uh, isovolemic osmotic increase and when you do that ADH goes up and down in a very linear fashion in contrast when you have isotonic volume depletion what happens is that for the first five to seven to uh, seven to ten percent there is absolutely no change in ADH and ADH goes up as a last ditch effort to save the organism once the volume goes below seven to ten percent and then there is an exponential rise in ADH as that last ditch effort so that is uh, kind of going to the basics and so now we'll start with causes and the algorithm that I follow for hyponatremia. So the first case is a 55-year-old male with cirrhosis from alcohol who presented for a scheduled endoscopy as part of his liver transplant workout and was noted to have an asymptomatic serum sodium of 128. His serum osmolarity was 260. Urine osmolarity was 450 and urine sodium was 8. He was not on any diuretics. So what is the cause of his hyperkalemia? Is it cirrhosis due to the effective circulating volume depletion? Is it beer cocomania? Is this SI ADH or is this true volume depletion? So as I look at hyponatremia, the first thing I evaluate is the serum osmolarity. And in this case, the serum osmolarity is low at 260. 
But if it is normal or high, then you have to evaluate the person for pseudo hyponatremia or hyperglycemia. If, uh, as is in this case, the serum osmolarity is low, then you have hypoosmolar hyponatremia. And then the next step to look at is the urine osmolarity. The urine osmolarity should be less than 100 if the brain is sensing the osmolarity and shutting down ADH. And if the kidney is responding to that um, no ADH state with maximal, uh, maximally dilute urine, then the urine osmolarity should be less than 100. And in that state, the only two entities that can cause hyponatremia despite having a maximum dilute urine is primary polydipsia and weird polydipsia. In this case, the urine osmolarity is 450. And so what it means is that the ADH is being secreted and the kidney is responding to that ADH. So in that case, the next step to evaluate is the urine sodium. And if the urine sodium is less than 20, then what it reflects is that there is either true volume depletion or effective volume depletion and that this ADH revved up is because that the volume loss is more than 7 to 10 percent and it is the last ditch effort uh, by the body in that regard and so the ADH is revved up after all effect or uh, the volume loss was more than 7 to 10 percent. In this case, uh, the urine sodium is 80, which is more than 40. And so what it means is that the ADH is not being um, secreted due to any uh, sensed volume loss or the renin angioaldo system being revved up. So what you have to then uh, assess the person for is either SIADH or hypothyroid or hypocortisolism, which can present or uh, uh, appear like SIADH. So in this case, this patient has SIDH. And as it turned out, the reason for the SIDH was that this patient during their evaluation for trans liver transplant had been recently diagnosed as depressive depression and was started on an SSRI. So the serotonin uh, receptor uptake uh, inhibitor. And uh, so that was the cause of his SIDH. So we stopped it and his SIDH uh, resolved and the result. So coming to uh, the second case, uh, it's a 24 year old male who is an alcoholic and presented to the emergency after being found down by the family. His blood pressure is 120 by 80 and he appears you will. Uh, serum sodium is 128, urine uh, serum osmolarity is 265 and urine osmolarity is 60. The urine sodium is less than 10. So the cause of his hyponatremia, is it pseudo hyponatremia? Is it beer potomania? Is it volume depletion or is it SIADH? So coming back to the algorithm again. So again, the serum osmolarity in this case is low, 265. So this is hypoosmolar hyponatremia. Then we look at the urine osmolarity and the urine osmolarity is low at 60, which is what it should be in the setting of hyponat hyponatremia. And so the body is trying to put out as dilute a urine as possible. And so this patient has beer potomania. And so one of the people messages from this is that the low urine sodium, which is there, is actually due to the very dilute urine with an osmolarity of only 60. And that is why the urine sodium uh, is low. So one of the other things to um, talk about uh, in this situation is how does the body regulate the osmolarity and the volume intake and how does uh, the body adjust. So in a normal person, the solute intake in a day is 600 milliosm. And if the water intake uh, is one liter, then the kidney, the ADH adjustment and the kidneys adjustment will cause the urine osmolarity to be adjusted to 600 milliosm and the person will excrete one liter and he is in net water balance. If uh, the same person the next day takes 200, two liters of fluid and the osmolarity intake remains the same at 600, the, the ADH will be adjusted and the kidney will adjust the urine osmolarity to 300. The person will put out two liters and again he is in balance. If we increase the water intake to six liters, the kidney adjusts with the ADH being shut off to 100 
and you put out six liters in urine balance. So what happens in beer potomania is that your intake is actually very low. You are focusing on uh, beer. You're not taking any salt and you're not taking any protein. And so your solute intake is very low at 200 milliosomes. And with beer, you get a lot of fluid intake. And so your intake can be as high as four liters. And even with a very dilute urine of 100 osomes, the maximum with 200 osomes of solute intake that you will be able to put out is two liters. And so what ends up happening is you're taking in four liters, but the kidney can only get rid of two. And so your net two liters positive. And if you keep doing this day in day out, you continue to get more and more hyponatremic over time. In primary polydipsia, what will happen is your solute intake is normal. You're eating a 600 milliosm intake, but the water intake will be very, very high. And you will need to take 14 liters worth of fluid because if your urine osmolarity is 100, you'll be able to get rid of six liters. If it goes down as low as 50, you should be able to get rid of 12 liters. So depending on how low the kidney can go, 50 to 100 is uh, the usual range. You will be, if you take 14 liters, you'll be two to eight liters positive, depending on how low the kidney can go. So another take home message is that beer potomania or tea and toast, uh, which is also called, is or primary polydipsia is too much water intake for the amount of solute intake that you're doing. And the kidney cannot handle uh, that much amount of fluid. So if you cut down the fluid intake in these situations, then the hyponatremia will resolve on its own because the kidney is already putting out a maximally dilute urine in that situation and will then be able to um, go back to matching your input and output. So coming to the third case. So this is a 89 year old male who falls on the side of a road coming out after watching a, a movie. And after he falls, he's in severe pain and he's brought directly to the emergency and found to have an impaction type fracture. He's also a heavy smoker and has COPD. As soon as he arrives in the emergency, his initial serum sodium is 123. Serum osmolarity is 260. Urine osmolarity is 290. And his urine sodium is 73. So what is the cause of his hyponatremia? Is it SIADH from the pain uh, after his fall? Is it SIADH from some other cause? Is it volume depletion or is it primary polydipsia? So we'll go back to the algorithm. So again, the urine serum osmolarity is low at 260, hypoosmolar hyponatremia. The urine osmolarity is more than 100, which means that the ADH is being secreted by the brain and the kidney is responding to that ADH. And the urine sodium is high as well at 73. So this can be SIADH. Um, the question still leaves whether this is SIDH from pain or whether this is SIDH that was there pre-existing. And the reason we know this is pre-existing rather than just SIDH from pain is that even if you develop SIDH, you have to drink water to become hyponatremic. And this patient was brought in as soon as he fell directly from the fall to the emergency and his labs were checked and he was already hyponatremic. So his all was likely due to the hyponatremia and not the other way around. And when we evaluated this person for um, uh, SIADH, we found that he had lung cancer. And this is important because if we attribute the hyponatremia to pain and the SIADH to pain, then we won't go looking for it and uh, we might miss a cancer in that situation. So coming back to kind of intake and output and how, we, how it is matched, so in normal people, as we just discussed, you can uh, take one or six liters of intake and the body will adjust the urine osmolarity to from 600 to 100 or even 50 to 1200 to adjust the uh, water output or urine output to match what the input is. However, if you have SIDH, you have a fixed osmolarity. So I'll take a few different scenarios of osmolarity in this situation. So let's say the urine osmolarity is fixed at 200 with 600 milliosm input uh, intake and uh, 200 urine osmolarity fixed. You will put out three liters. So if your intake is two liters, then you will be negative by one liter every day. And if you were hyponatremic, you will improve uh, every day. 
However, if your urine osmolarity is fixed at 400, you will secrete or excrete those same 600 milliosomes now in one and a half liters. If you take two liters every day, now you're going to be positive by half a liter every day and you're going to get hyponatremic by half a liter every day and over time this will accumulate. If uh, your urine osmolarity is fixed at 600, then the same 600 milliosomes are now going to get excreted in one liter. And if you take two liters of input, you're going to be positive by one liter and that one liter is going to accumulate. If your urine osmolarity is even higher at 900, the same 600 osmoles are now going to be excreted in uh, uh, two thirds, uh, two third of a liter or 0.67. And you're going to be positive by 1.3 liters every day. So the next uh, case uh, to talk about uh, is a 60 year old male with lung cancer who presents with nausea and vomiting and his initial blood pressure is 80 by 40 with dry mucous membranes and the mental status is normal. Serum sodium is 1.4, serum osmolarity is 260, urine osmolarity is 600 and urine sodium is less than 10. So the cause of his hyponatremia, is it volume depletion, is it SIDH from the cancer, is it both of them or we cannot say it present in reassess after IV fluids. So this is actually a trick question to kind of highlight a few things. So right now what I would say is that he has volume depletion which is certain and whether the volume depletion or SIDH is the cause of his hyponatremia, uh, it's hard to say and we can reassess this after giving IV fluids. So if we give him three liters of normal saline and repeat his evaluation, if he has SIADH as the cause of his hyponatremia, what you will find is that the serum sodium will remain unchanged. The urine osmolarity will remain unchanged because the urine osmolarity is dictated by the ADH coming from the SIADH. And now the urine sodium, because you've given him the three liters of normal saline, he's now volume replete the renin angio aldo system will shut down and now the kidney will excrete the urine uh, urinary sodium back to its normal and it will go back go up to more than 40. So this will tell you that he is now volume replete and that the SIDH is the cause for his hyponatremia. In contrast if this patient had volume depletion as the cause of his hyponatremia and you gave him volume and completely corrected his volume deficit the serum sodium would have improved, the urine osmolarity would go down and that is because the ADH was being driven by the volume. So as the volume loss gets repeated, the ADH will come down on the curve as is shown in the picture below and the ADH will come down from whatever 15-20% volume loss all the way down to 5 and 7 and once it gets down to 5 and 7, the ADH will shut down completely. As ADH shuts down completely, the urine osmolarity will go to less than 100 and you're going to put out dilute urine and your sodium will rapidly improve. As you've already completely corrected his fluid, let's say in that situation, the urine sodium will be more than 40. If in contrast, the deficit was let's say 6 or 7 liters or even 10 liters and you've given only 3 liters so far, the serum sodium would improve, the urine osmolarity will be lower than before because the curve is coming down and the urine sodium would still be less than 10 because it will show that the renin angio aldo system is still revved up and the kidney is still sodium avid in response to that aldosterone. So now I'll switch gears and talk about symptoms and the symptoms of hyponatremia are driven by uh, uh, brain edema and this um, picture from uh, Nick Medias and, and Rogi uh, is a good reflection of that. So you start with the normal brain on the left corner and as you develop uh, hyponatremia, uh, the brain will gain water and cerebral edema will happen and um, the symptoms will happen from this immediate effect and the rapidity and severity of the hyponatremia will dictate how quickly and how much water is gained. The brain will adapt. Initially, there is a rapid adaptation by loss of sodium, potassium and chloride. And then there is a slow adaptation by loss of other organic uh, osmolites like myonostol, glutamine and other um, osmolites. 
and uh, with this situation is where you may have someone who is asymptomatic with uh, hyponatremia and if you treat them slowly they will go back to a normal brain with normal osmolarity however if in this situation where the brain has already adapted you uh, rapidly correct them then what happens is that you have shrinkage of the brain and then you can get osmotic demyelination so the symptoms are uh, the neurologic dysfunction that is induced by hypoosmolarity and is due to cerebral edema and cerebral overhydration and the rapidity and degree of hypernatremia determines the symptoms the symptoms can be anything from nausea malaise headache lethargy seizures or coma focal symptoms only occur if there is an old infarct or an old lesion that is present and women particularly premenopausal women are at the highest risk for developing symptoms and getting irreversible neurological damage both from hyponatremia and also from osmotic demyelination so these uh, 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 you need to be more cautious and more aware of this uh, when you're treating someone as well as when they present another uh, thing which is uh, something to keep in mind is that uh, even mild chronic ambulatory hyponatremia there are lots of studies that have shown hyponatremia is associated with increased mortality in all different kinds of settings in the inpatient and this is a review article uh, which is looking at chronic ambulatory hyponatremia and so i've kind of taken this and it shows multiple studies which have shown that there is more increased mortality with hyponatremia and uh, that this varies all the way from uh, odds ratio of 1.2 to uh, 4 and 5 as well um, this uh, study also looked at all the other uh, parameters as well uh, including neurocognitive def deficits and those have been noted in multiple different studies as well as well as falls um, and the odds ratio of falls is anywhere from 1.3 to 67 as well and uh, with falls there comes bone fractures as well and there is also a thought that because of the sodium loss there is sodium loss from the bones as well and that also leads to weakening of the bones so there is falls which are higher as well as that there are fractures which are higher with hyponatremia uh, this is one of my favorite studies from 2006 uh, american journal of medicine where they actually uh, as part of their neurocognitive evaluation they had the patients walk while they were hyponatremic on the left panel and once the same patients had recovered from their hyponatremia and were now normonatremic on the right so if you look at their this is pressure uh, of where they put their feet and how they walk and if you look at the left they're all over the place and on the right once their hyponatremia is resolved they're in much better and straighter lines compared to what they were before so this is three different patients uh, they're walking much straighter and when they compared them to people who were drunk um, the hyponatremics were actually worse than those who were drunk and this did get better as can be seen on the right panel after their hyponatremia had resolved so now we'll come to treatment and i'll go over a few cases of treatment as well uh, so the first case is a 30 year old female who was admitted for a lap cholecystectomy and had been receiving d5 half normal saline at 100 ml per hour post extubation she had severe pain and uh, nausea and was unable to eat much next day she was found to be altered and incoherent and her lab sodium uh, revealed uh, that her serum sodium was 150 and her weight is 60 kgs so what would you uh, treat uh, with pre-water restriction change the iv fluid to normal saline at 100 ml per hour give three percent hypertonic saline at 60 ml per hour for four hours do free water restriction plus three grams salt so uh, my answer is going to be that we should give 3% hypertonic saline at 60 ml per hour for four hours because this is someone who is symptomatic and she's at the highest risk of uh, getting cerebral edema seizures and more because she is one young female and she's had a, a rapid decline in her sodium so the two basic principles of treatment are one raising the sodium at a safe rate and treating the underlying condition 
the biggest question that you have to answer up front whenever you see someone with hyponatremia first is are they symptomatic or not if they are symptomatic then you need to do aggressive correction within the first 3 to 4 hours and then the final 24 hour correction always remains the same that you want to keep it below 10 to 12 and less than 18 in first 48 hours so the other part to kind of keep in mind is that it is not 10 to 12 every day going forward it is 10 to 12 in the first 24 hours and then less than 18 in the first 48 hours and uh, this uh, data of why we should correct it by less than 10 or less than 12 in the first 24 hours is based on a case series that were done in the 1990s and uh, what they found was that those who had osmotic demyelination were almost always cases in which there was a more rapid correction than this so how do you decide uh, what dose of uh, three percent uh, to give so the total sodium deficit would be uh, 0.5 into the lean body weight into 140 minus uh, the sodium that is currently uh, there however what is more important is how much do you want to correct and so that is again 0.5 into the body weight and the target sodium that you want to achieve minus the sodium so let's take this 60 kg female with the sodium of 150 and the goal is to raise it by let's say four in the first four hours and then a total of 10 over the full 24 hours so for the first four hours her weight is 60 kgs 0.5 that would be 30 30 into 4 120 meqs so you uh, would need to give 120 meqs and with three percent normal saline which is 512 meq that's approximately one meq in 2 ml so 120 meqs would be in 240 ml and because you want to give it over four hours it will be 60 ml per hour after the first four hours are done you want to correct by another six so four plus six ten for the full 24 hours so for the next 20 hours the correction is going to be 0.5 into 60 multiplied by six so the total correction of four in the first four hours and six more in the next 10 hours so that is going to be 180 meqs which will be 360 meqs that you want to 360 ml that you want to give over the next 20 hours and that will come out to 18 ml per hour if we had a different case in which someone had a serum sodium of 114 and they were asymptomatic so the goal was a total slow correction over 24 hours so then what you would do is 0.5 into 60 into 12 so 360 meq so that's about 720 ml per hour 720 ml total of three percent and that will come out over 24 hours to 30 ml per hour so if someone wants to just use a quick calculation as a shortcut for three percent so for 24 hour correction it's actually 0.5 into weight and that you give at ml per hour uh, so for a 60 kg person it's going to be about 30 ml per hour so the caveats on the sodium that we give are that this applies only to administration of salt without water so either it is salt tablets or hypertonic saline it does not apply to normal saline this is only an estimate and serial measurements will be needed uh, to ensure that you are on track and you're not over or under correcting and that it does not account for ongoing losses or other isosmotic losses as well so coming to the next case so this is a 30 year old female who has severe diarrhea for five to six days and presents to the emergency with hypotension on initial labs her serum sodium is 115 um, without any uh, neurological symptoms she receives five liters and six hours later when her serum sodium is rechecked she has a serum sodium of 125 and she is now putting out copious amount of dilute urine so what would be your next step are you going to stop iv fluids monitor clinically for any neurological symptoms or osmotic demyelination are you going to give d5 with the ddavp or are you going to monitor labs and only intervene after she reaches 130. so in this case uh, my answer is going to be that we should give d5 and ddavp and we should reverse the rapid rise uh, that she has had and uh, prevent her from developing osmotic demyelination because she is at the highest risk a 30 year old female with a very reversible cause of hyponatremia which was volume depletion and she's already rapidly corrected and she's going to continue and correct all the way to 140 very quickly and she did not have any symptoms to begin with so osmotic demyelination so rapid correction can lead to central demyelinating lesions especially in the pons 
it's an osmotic shrinkage of the axon severing severing the connection to the surrounding malin sheets and symptoms usually occurs two to six days after the correction and uh, they can include paraparesis quadriparesis dysarthria dysphagia and coma and that is irreversible if you have a high suspicion you can confirm by ct or mri but many times these lesions may not be detected till four weeks after the event has happened so this is predominantly a clinical diagnosis and unfortunately there is no treatment after it has developed so the risk factors are a more than 12 correction within the first 24 hours there's some uh, case reports of even 10 and above which is why the european guidelines and some of the other guidelines have moved to 10 in the first 24 hours correction to more than 140 in the first two days people who are hypercatabolic malnourished and alcoholics are more at risk and as we've talked before the young uh, premenopausal females are at higher risk and again there is no treatment after you develop this so what we need to do is prevent development and so before symptoms we can try to reverse this by giving d5 water or oral water with or without some ddavp but that has to be done with expert supervision as well as close monitoring and this is based on a couple a few case reports that are noted below and a very well done uh, animal study that has been published in ki in 1994 by supart where they did um, rapid correction in mice and then they randomly lowered the sodium in some uh, mice and they found that they developed less neurological damage or no neurological damage compared to the mice that they did not intervene on. So uh, the next case uh, is a 70 year old male with lung cancer who presents in the clinic with asymptomatic serum sodium of 125, serum osmolarity of 260 and urine osmolarity of 900. And the urine sodium is 150. So how would you manage it? With fluid restriction only, fluid restriction plus salt tabs, fluid restriction plus furosemide or normal saline for two liters. So again, for this, I would go with fluid restriction and furosemide and I'll kind of explain why I think uh, doing any of the others would not be sufficient. So going back to the table that we had before of uh, SIADH uh, patients who have different levels of osmolarity. So if your uh, urine osmolarity is 200 and you're taking a normal intake, with two liters of intake, uh, two liters of water intake, and your urine osmolarity at 200, you're going to put out three liters and you're going to be negative by one liter. So someone who has SIDH with a low urine osmolarity is going to be very easy to manage with fluid restriction as long as they have a normal intake or you can boost them up to a normal intake of salt and protein. And you restrict them even to two liters and they will correct their hyponatremia. In comparison, if someone has a urine osmolarity that's around 400, then they will be putting out 1.5 liters of urine uh, volume. And so if they take two liters, then they will continue to get worse. But if you can restrict them to one liter, they will lose half a kg every day or half a liter every day or in water. And they will correct their sodium uh, with that. In comparison, if you have a 600 uh, uh, SIDH with a urinosum that's around 600, even if you restrict them to one liter, they will put out one liter of output with a 600 osm intake and so they will maintain their sodium at one liter fluid restriction but they will not be able to correct uh, their hyponatremia that they have already developed so you will then need to either lower their osmolarity which can be with lasix or furosemide uh, because that will uh, knock out the loop uh, uh, loop of henle and so the kidney won't be able to concentrate the urine and urine osmolarity with Lasix or furosemide or torsamide is going to be usually near isosmotic, somewhere between 250 to 350. And so now that you've done that, uh, and their intake is 600 milliosms, and the urine osmolarity is 300, they will put out two liters. When they put out two liters and their fluid restricted to one liter, they will be negative by one liter every day, and they will correct uh, over the next few days. Another approach is to increase their solute intake by increasing their salt or giving them urea capsules or urea tablets or increasing their protein intake. And if you increase them to 900 milliosms, if you've also kept them on Lasix at 300, they will put uh, out urine of three liters. If uh, their urine osmolarity is 600, they'll put out one and a half liters. 
So even with increasing salt and protein and you increase their osmolarity to 900, you fluid restrict them to one liter, they will still be negative in terms of their water balance. If you have 900 as uh, SIDH with really high uh, ADH levels and a high urine osmolarity, then uh, you will need to lower their osmolarity with uh, furosemide to 300 or 400 range and add salt and protein intake as well to 900 and fluid restrict them because with that uh, with a 900 awesome intake and a urine osmolarity around 400 450 they'll put out two liters and then be negative so the take-home message is if your urine osmolarity is more than 600 then you will need furosemide or another approach to lower their osmolarity because only fluid restriction and salt or protein intake or urea tablets by itself is not going to be enough when your urine osmolarity is really really high so the treatment for SIDH you should also be aware that uh, there can be a paradoxical worsening with normal saline so even though normal saline has an osmolarity of 300 and this Sodium in that is 154, but what matters is not that this is 154 and the blood sodium is 110 or 120. What matters is how is this fluid coming in and how is this fluid going out? So if the urine osmolarity is 900, this 300 osms that you're giving are going to go out in only 300 ml and the remaining 660 ml are going to retain in the body. If the urine osmolarity is 600, then this 300 osmolarity or 300 osms are going to go out in 500 ml and the additional 500 ml the body will keep and so the hyponatremia will actually get worse if you give normal saline and the urine osmolarity is anything above 300 so you have to be careful when you give normal saline especially if the urine osmolarity is anything more than 300. so coming to another case a 70 year old female with lung cancer who presents with altered with uh, altered mental status and the weight is 60 kgs and the serum sodium is 115 but the potassium is low as well at 2.5 the urine osmolarity is 600 and the urine sodium is 75 so this is someone who has sidh from their lung cancer you decide that you're going to give 300 milliculons of sodium over the 24 hours but you also want to give him 80 meqs of potassium for his hypokalemia so the main question is whether giving potassium changes how much sodium you should give. So the combinations are 300 MEQs of sodium plus 80 of potassium, 220 of sodium plus 80 of potassium, 380 of sodium and 80 of potassium or 300 of sodium only. So the thing to remember is when you give potassium and it goes inside the extracellular fluid, that potassium is going to go and get buffered in the intracellular compartment. As the potassium concentration in the intracellular fluid goes up, water is going to get pulled from the in extracellular fluid to the intracellular compartment and that will cause the extracellular fluid concentration of sodium to also go up. So giving potassium is equal to giving sodium. So what you should do is if you want to give 300 MEQs and that is what your goal is for correction for that day, you need to give 220 of sodium and 80 of potassium and that together will uh, be enough to correct them appropriately as you have calculated. So the take home message is giving potassium to someone who has hyponatremia is the same as giving sodium. So the last case that I'll talk about is a 35 year old uh, asymptomatic alcoholic cirrhotic and he's admitted for endoscopy and found to have a serum sodium of 115. Despite two days of fluid restriction of one liter, he's not improving and his urine osmolarity is 200. So what should be your next step? Should we start him on Tolvaptin and continue fluid restriction? Should we start him on Tolvaptin and stop the fluid restriction? Should we give him protein supplementations and really restrict him to one liter? Or should we admit him in the ICU and give him 3% hypertonic saline? So as he's asymptomatic, um, I would not give him um, uh, any 3% saline. And my answer is going to be C, that we should give him protein supplementation and restrict fluid to one liter because his urine osmolarity is 200. So if his urine osmolarity is 200, the only way with a fluid restriction of one liter he's not correcting is if his intake is also serum a uh, solute intake is also 200 awesomes only which is why he's matching one liter to one liter and not improving or the other option is he's eating a normal intake of 600 but he's not really restricting his fluid intake to one liter so a urine osmolarity of 200 should be uh, possible to just supplement with protein and restrict him really to one liter 
and that should correct him as well. So now let me talk about tolvaptin and the V2 receptor antagonists. And this is the uh, SALT trial. Uh, this is the table from the SALT trial, which was published in 2006. The top panel is uh, SALT 1, uh, all patients. The top left, uh, the top right is SALT 2. And that had about 119 uh, in the tolvaptin, 115 patients in the placebo arm. And SALT 1 had 95 and 91. And what it shows is that when you give tolvaptin, the sodium goes up uh, nicely and stays up compared to if you're on placebo and the difference is about five MEQs and as soon as you stop which is at 30 days uh, in this trial the sodium comes down quickly and goes down to what it would have been if they had been on placebo and the same is true for salt one salt two and the bottom panel is those patients with marked hyponatremia and they also if you're placebo uh, they also went up to about 130s but if they were on tolvaptin, they went up to 135 and they stayed at 135 on average and came down as soon as you stopped uh, the tolvaptin. So the message is that uh, tolvaptin is effective in raising sodium. Overall, in the trial, it appeared to be safe. And the effect lasts only while you're taking medicine. Uh, no mortality benefit was found. And uh, the improvement in quality of life or the other impacts on fractures and neurocognitive were not answered completely by this trial. So how to use Vaptin? So when you look at this trial or the other trials where they've been used, you have to remember that you should not fluid restrict or give additional treatment when you start on Vaptin. You have to watch very closely for overcorrection and stop if there is overcorrection. In the SOL trials, the rapid correction of um, more than 12 and 24 hours was found in 2% of patients. So this is in a trial setting and we'll talk about uh, in the next few slides what happens in real life. Um, you should not use it if the sodium is less than 120 because the lower the sodium, the more likely that it is going to move, rise more rapidly with tolvaptin and it is not indicated for anyone who is symptomatic with hyponatremia. If someone has symptoms with hyponatremia, you need to give 3%. All patients were hospitalized when they were initiated. So please do not do this as an outpatient. You should admit patients if you're going to give them tolvaptin. The diagnosis that it's been used for is SIDH, cirrhosis, and CHF, for which you can use them. If someone is hypovolemic, polydipsic, head trauma, or post-op, or it is due to drugs uh, which are withdrawable, don't use uh, uh, tolvaptin in those situations. Anyone who has AKI or CKD, uh, in those situations, it should not be used. In the trial, the cutoff was 3.5. From the ADP, ADPKD use of tolvaptin, um, there have been uh, cases of severe liver dysfunction and liver disease. And so um, we should, uh, if we are using tolvaptin for a longer period of time, we should monitor LFTs on it as well. So now let's look at some of the other studies which have looked at rapid correction. So this is an Otsuka study. Um, where they looked at lower doses than the 15 milligrams, which is the starting dose that was recommended in healthy adults as well as in SIDH patients. So the left is the healthy adults. And what they found is that in these, uh, even the 3.75 milligrams in healthy adults caused a rise of sodium of 2 and as high as 4 MEQs in um, healthy adults when they took a single dose of 3.75 or 15 milligrams. And this is time in hours over that first day. And these are healthy adults who were allowed to drink as much fluid as they wanted and they were not on any other treatment. Then they used the same uh, 3.75, 7.5 and 15 milligrams in SIDH patients. The goal was 10 patients in each arm and a single oral dose was given. They defined rapid correction as more than eight in the first eight hours or more than 12 in 24 hours. And even with the 3.75 dose, they had one out of 10 who had more than eight correction. They had another one out of 10 with the 7.5 milligram. Uh, and then they had two out of eight, one who had both a more than eight in eight hours and more than 12 in 24 hours. And another patient who had one uh, who had more than 12 in 24 hours. So a total of four out of 28, 14% had over correction with a single dose, and this was even below the dose of 15, 3.75 and 7.5 as well. When you look at the SALT trial and you look at um, SIADH patients 
uh, alone, the three out of 51, which is 6% overcorrected with the first dose, and 7% had a more than eight in the first eight hours, and the 2% which was put in the trial was for more than 12 in 24 hours. So then we look at a trial, uh, a study which was done in um, the US, which was published in 2018 in American Journal of Kidney Disease, where they looked at five US hospitals and they combined their data to look at retrospectively patients who had SIADH or heart failure, 28 in the SIADH and 39 in the heart failure, who had a sodium less than 130 and were treated with trolvaptin 15 milligrams. They excluded any patients who had additional fluid restriction or any salt tablets that were being done. So those patients who were on fluid restriction and salt tablets while tolvaptin was given were excluded from the study. All heart failure patients were also on loop diuretics. The average sodium was 121 for SIDA and 122 for CHF patients. 25% of them had overcorrection with SIDH and 3% in heart failure. So that is on the left side. 25% uh, had overcorrection of more than 12 in 24 hours and even a higher percentage uh, had a correction of more than 8 in 24 hours and these were asymptomatic patients so we don't need to correct them that quickly in the first place. The efficacy was good if you give tolvaptin you get a, a pretty good uh, rise uh, and uh, more than 3 MEQ rise was seen in more than 90% of patients. So again, uh, this highlights that when you use tolvaptin, you need to be more cautious and you need to monitor more closely. So this is a study from Supart uh, in C. Jason from 2012. And in this study, 12 patients with SIADH uh, were treated with satavaptin or tolvaptin for one year. So this is the time in the bottom is in months, and that is 12 months in the bottom. And so when they started with tolvaptin or satavaptin, their sodium came up nicely. They stayed in the 135 and above range for one year. Uh, however, due to financial issues, uh, the tolvaptin was not available through the study. And so they decided to stop the tolvaptin for these 12 patients. And they dropped uh, within the first uh, eight days to 125 or 127 uh, within that eight day holiday period. And then they started them on urea tablets, uh, which are available in Belgium where this study was done and they gave them either 15 grams or 30 grams of urea tablet and what they found is over the next one year these 12 patients with SIADH maintained their sodium equivalent to being on tolvaptin and six to seven patients who were the same patients as before in the tolvaptin arm or tolvaptin or satavaptin arm and had those patients had about 30 percent of their readings that were below 135. So again showing that uh, even with either a high protein or high salt or urea which is going to be excreted in the uh, through the kidney you can manage patients with SIDH on a long-term basis as well so this is a study uh, the insight trial which has been published in AJKD in 2016 and this focused on the neurocognitive uh, aspects and so they had patients who were this is a randomized double blind placebo controlled trial 29 patients in the placebo uh, in the tolvaptin arm 27 in the placebo arm and they were titrated after randomization to either 15 and then titrated up to 30 or 60 uh, depending on their sodium and uh, uh, getting them up to about 135 and till day four and then they were maintained on that dose till day 22 and then they were taken off therapy the main and the primary goal was to look at their neurocognitive domains which were looked at reaction time psychomotor speed and processing speed and this all three were combined into an ncs csd scoring system um, the goal was tolvaptin and placebo and when tolvaptin was start because this was a randomized double blind both tolvaptin and placebo there was no fluid restriction at the initial phase but after a few days, if a hyponatremia persisted, fluid restriction could be added uh, at that point. The baseline neurocognitive scores for both placebo and tolvaptin were worse than normal people at minus 1.37 and minus 1.55. However, at the end of the study, uh, at day 22, there was no difference between those on tolvaptin and those in placebo in the total neurocognitive uh, scoring. 
uh, when they did sub analysis and secondary analysis the psychomotor speed was better statistically whether it was clinically significant or not is still unanswered so take home message for the tolvaptin is that it works uh, you need to be very careful in when where and how to use them i pay personally very rarely use them and i'm able to manage most of my patients with a combination of salt and protein supplementation fluid restriction and furosemide so i would like to acknowledge dr burton rose dr vijay khair and dr jha who helped me uh, to uh, understand and uh, be able to present hyponatremia as i just did and i'll take questions if there are any at this point thank you thank you ajay for a very delightful enjoyable and an enlightening presentation i have uh, some questions already i hope i am audible yeah yeah absolutely okay the first question comes from dr subai pradhan do you need slow correction of sodium in barter syndrome in barter syndrome yes so barter syndrome shouldn't have hyponatremia by itself uh because they will usually have hypokalemia and hyponatremia but if there is and um, if there is someone with hyponatremia and they are asymptomatic neurologically they will need a slow correction just like anyone else so so if someone has hyponatremia whether it is barter's or any other disease they will need a slow correction um and you will need to be cautious uh in those kind of a situation um uh, and you as you replace potassium as i showed potassium is equal to giving sodium so you will need to be cautious in how much sodium you uh, give because the potassium will count as sodium as well the next question is from dr venkatesh rajkumar should we be bothered about rapidity of correction if we are really sure about the acute nature of hyponatremia so um i would still say that even if you so if there is someone who was you know that his labs were 140 yesterday this is an inpatient and they have dropped to 120 today you can bring them up to 140 by tomorrow if you know that their lab was 140 yesterday means this is an inpatient 140 to 120 you can bring them up to 140 by the next day however most patients you don't know when they drop whether it was 24 hours or 48 hours or 72 hours in most situations i would say you should stick to 10 there is no reason why you want to correct them all the way up to if they are 120 there is nothing to be gained from getting them up all the way up to 140 as long as you get them up some they will be better so if someone is has not had a seizure at 120 they will not have a seizure at 124 as long as you get them up some you are in the right direction and you can slowly correct them up there is no um advantage to getting them up all the way to 140 the question becomes a little tricky if you uh, uh need to lower them and that will be an individualized decision hello 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 dr modi hello hello hello
हेलो हेलो हाय यस नाउ वी कैन हियर ओके सॉरी या आई थिंक वी ऑल लॉस्ट एवरीथिंग सो द क्वेश्चन दैट वाज लास्ट गोइंग ऑन आई थिंक वी कैन मूव टू द नेक्स्ट the sure. question from dr venkatesh rajkumar is do you evaluate aggressively for etiology of siadh if it's not very obvious so i would try to kind of go through uh, the basic uh, three things to focus on any neurological issues any pulmonary issues and any drugs so i would kind of go through at least that basic evaluation and i will absolutely check thyroid and cortisol and all of them up front so before i label someone as a sidh i will absolutely first make sure that the thyroid and cortisol are normal because those are easy fixes rather than labeling labeling someone as a sidh i would kind of hello? do that hello 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 Hello. Hello. हेलो 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 हाय Hi Ajay. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Some technical issues. Yes. Uh, some maybe some network issues from the weather. We are sure. at 8:30 p.m., which is the closing time for the webinar. Uh, we can continue with one or two questions as long as the yes. webinar screen allows us. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Right. And in case we lose the connection, uh, thank you and happy evening to everyone. So the next next question is. Uh, from dr krishna sahu how do you differentiate siadh from cerebral salt wasting and how do you treat cerebral salt wasting yeah so cerebral salt wasting i definitely try to stay away from that um, mostly because there is debate as to whether that entity exists and uh, whether um, that is any different or whether it is only siadh and there is um, other features that are going on so some people do believe in cerebral salt wasting and those who do uh, would focus on the uric acid and the uric acid excretion as well as kind of focus on those things on that front um the main difference if you believe in it would be that you need to give salt um in that situation and you need to prove some amount of volume depletion with hypotension or something else to prove that this is cerebral salt wasting and not just sidh um so i can't say that i've seen enough cerebral salt wasting to uh, treat them any differently i would focus again on 
the urine osmolarity and then based on that uh, treat them and manage them with that great uh, can i chip in a question you had a mortality sure. association with hyponatremia uh, that would beg for causality are we dealing with forward or reverse causality or some uh, co associations here yeah so i think the uh, no one has shown that treating hyponatremia ret uh, retards mortality so um, the mortality with hyponatremia is predominantly associated with diseases like heart failure and liver disease and other diseases that go along with um, hyponatremia as well so i think it is more related to the sickness and the illness that is causing the hyponatremia rather than that the hyponatremia is causing mortality so um, the this is more that they are um, confounding each other or being their coexistent rather than the mechanism of mortality is through hyponatremia uh, because there's been lots of studies and lots of trials that have used either tolvaptin or other uh, vaptins in um, sick patients and there has been no evidence of any uh, reduction in mortality one question from dr bhanu mishra can we apply algorithm in ckd5 patients with high urea and creatinine situations so any so i actually have a case which i took out uh, which is the same case where you have a ckd patient who comes to the outpatient clinic and they have hyponatremia with a high urea the urea is an ineffective osmol so it should not be counted and if you are taking the urine serum osmolarity which in this case is 295 you will need to re remove the urea osmolarity from it and then do the algorithm so in this case this will come out to 260 and so this is exactly like any other case and he is hypoosmolar hyponatremia and he has sidh um and so you have to remove the urea um osmolarity from the serum osmolarity and then assess the case because urea is an ineffective osmol so so in that situation i would answer that way ckd 5 patients you don't need to do the algorithm at all they have almost no free water clearance so if you have a dialysis patient he is a closed system so he is taking in dilute intake and he has no output so his he is going to get hyponatremic from that so you don't need to do any algorithm for them at all and uh, you can just label them as such great another question elderly hypertensive asymptomatic with sodium 125 to 130 on tell me sartan chlorthalidone what would you do would you stop chlorthalidone or just fluid restriction so um the studies with thiazides have well documented that it is a quick disorder it is not something that it is going to be years in the making so if someone on chlorthalidone did not have hyponatremia after one week of chlorthalidone unless you change the dose if you increase the dose then uh, you will have to reassess after the increased dose but if on the same dose they were not hyponatremic and now they are hyponatremic on that dose chlorthalidone is not the reason they are getting hyponatremia so you need to investigate for why they are developing hyponatremia now i would still remove the chlorthalidone to allow the kidney to have a better free water clearance than on the chlorthalidone but the reason they are developing hyponatremia i would not blame on the chlorthalidone i would look for other causes wait so we will pass the 8:30 pm deadline it's uh, time to bid a bye thank you ajay and thank you all the audience for joining in and it was really enjoyable have a good evening okay modi